So my name is Sean Norris. I'm a solutions architect with uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, I am based in Singapore, as Mike said, but uh, you know I've been in Cape Town on and off since about 2005. Um, despite the obvious sound of my accent, I'm actually Canadian, so hopefully that's a plus point. <laughs> And uh, you know, I've got uh, deep ties here. My wife is South African, and uh, it's fantastic to be back in Cape Town. Um, you know, kind of looking out, I'm realizing that uh, you know maybe the ScaleConf organizers are feeling that they made a bit of a mistake because you've kind of got a sales guy up for the next 45 minutes. So you're gonna have to bear with me. I'm feeling I'm feeling kind of like I wore shoes, which is maybe a I didn't realize was optional, but uh, and I'm feeling very underbearded. But uh, other than that, let's get started. <laughs> So, you know, um, you know, being in a sales team, I had to pick a catchy title, but, uh, you know, let's talk about the, uh, the obvious one first. You know, what is all this nonsense about horses and unicorns? Well, you know, I had the uh, good fortune of attending the DevOps Enterprise Summit in San Francisco back in October last year, and uh, you know, hosted by Gene Kim, who wrote The Phoenix Project. And a lot, there was a lot of talk of horses and unicorns. And for the first half day of the conference, I was sitting there going, I don't really get this. What is all this talk of horses and unicorns? So, you know, it's really simple. If, you know, a lot of things we hear about DevOps are, well, that's all great if you're a Silicon Valley funded startup or if you're Pinterest or you're, you know, Facebook or Amazon or Google, one of these big, you know, super tech forward companies, well, those are kind of unicorns. I actually work for like a bank or an insurance company or just a normal company. We're just horses. So that's all there is. You know, um, you know horses are unicorns without a pointy bit on the front. So um, if, if you're thinking like maybe this DevOps business is just for unicorns, well, I, th I think the punchline of, of my talk today is going to be um, well, it's not really. It's uh, how to deliver business value faster for your company, whether whether you put yourself in the horse category or the unicorn. So really what we're going to do is a quick uh, flyby through like what we're learning at Amazon from our customers in terms of DevOps, what's working, what's not. And, you know, really it's up to you to decide at the end of this whether DevOps might be something you're already doing, might be something you're evaluating, and you know, is it just buzzword or is it like, is there actually some substance behind it? So you know, when we when we talk about DevOps, it's worth a very quick history lesson of you know how things used to be. Like the old way we used to build software, and anybody here ever lived through a waterfall design software process? Ah, I'm I'm in good company. Um, so you know, there was all kinds of fancy wheel diagrams like we've got here of how we'd build software, but it basically we'd do everything all up front and we'd gather tons of requirements and then we'd build stuff for a year or two and then we'd deliver something at the end that often looked like nothing like people wanted and didn't really fulfill much business value. Anybody ever lived through a bad waterfall project? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, waterfalls are interesting and a guy named Scott Ambler who writes a fantastic book on refactoring databases. If you're struggling doing database migrations or or wrangling databases, you should really read Scott's book. And here's what he has to say about waterfalls, that they're wonderful tourist attractions, but they're spectacularly bad strategies for organizing software development projects. And, you know, hopefully this is like the blindingly obvious. Like, th this should not be controversial in this room that waterfall is not a great way to do things. And I know there's a good proportion of you thinking, well, this is the token South African slide, by the way. But like, isn't uh, like, didn't Agile fix all this? Like, we've been doing Agile for 10, 12, 14 years, and like, didn't didn't Agile just magically make waterfall go away? Didn't it fix all of this? Well, not really. If we look at our typical code pipeline, your pipeline might have extra steps in it or different names, but you know, you start developing stuff and you test it. Hopefully, while you're developing it. And eventually, you need to put it into production so that it runs and delivers some business value. Well, once we started doing Agile, that often just touched the dev portion of that process. And so we, were, we got really good at gathering requirements. And you know, there are people like Karen and Sam that we heard last night who will come and help you figure out how to do this better and gather requirements and you know, do it in an iterative way and be much more closer to the business and deliver software that people want to use and that actually works. Well, that was great, but often when it came to testing it and then putting it into production, things looked an awful lot like waterfall still. And you know, better organizations figured out, well, how do we bring our developers and testers together? And maybe quality and testing is everybody's problem now. So 
the, the QA guy has kind of got brought into the development fold in a lot of organizations, but when it came time to put it into production, well, that's a separate team. So, you know, even with Agile and Dev Test, we saw that like configuration drift was a big problem. Anybody had problems keeping like dev versus production in sync? No one's ever had that problem. And um, <laughs> it, it was really expensive to replicate environments. Like, you know, a, a long time ago, I was in London working for a startup. And, you know, that was in the pre-cloud, pre-virtualization days. And so we had to go spend millions of pounds on hardware. And we had to like beg, borrow, and steal just to get enough to run production. There was no way we were going to go buy $50,000 F5 load balancers to put in dev so that we could have dev look exactly like production. And you guys have probably all seen varying versions of that problem where, you know, it, it, even if you could, it was really expensive and it wasn't practical to replicate environments. And then manual deployments were just everywhere and error prone. So when we look at the infrastructure that you were usually dealing with across these, you were probably on like desktops or in a broom closet or something for your development environment. And then, you know, you'd stick it in a slightly bigger broom closet for your test environment and a personal experience at least. And then, you know, some version of a data center for your production environment. And then, you know, to actually make things move between these environments would take, you know, maybe days and then to get it into production was weeks. And, you know, weeks might be a high double digit number. So when, when you look at, well, how did we actually do that? Well, the migrations from development to testing, there was some automation there. I can remember back in the, in the good old days of this where you know, there was some level of unit testing and automated building going on. But then inevitably, when it came to production, it was manual. It was like, here's some code. Please go deploy this. And well, what did our organization look like? Well. We'd have a, a, usually a sizable bunch of guys writing code, and you know, a lot of guys in this room have probably been in this spot. And then, you know, QA was often a lot smaller, and sometimes it was microscopically small, so that it looked like it almost wasn't there. And then some sort of production operations team, and that's where guys like, you know, like me came in, and you know, having kind of come up on the infrastructure side, that we always got along perfectly with the guys from development, right? You know, it was, it was great because, you know, if you think about it, the dev test team and those kind of merged and came together, especially as Agile became more of a thing. Well, but their whole job was to write new features. Hopefully do it well and high quality and all the rest of it, but constant business pressure and scrums and product owners saying, write new features, write new features. That's how they got bonuses. It's how they got paid. And my job was uptime. So mutually incompatible and, you know, I... You know, if, if I allowed these guys to write new features too fast, then I couldn't do my goal of keeping the site up. So, big problems. So, what did we end up happening? Well, you kind of have this vicious cycle where, you know, you end up doing a large risky deployment, and it's manual, so it's going to be risky. And then, inevitably, you know, we screwed up from time to time. Not that we admitted it very often, but we would screw it up and it would fail. And then, the knee-jerk reaction was, well, clearly these production operations guys aren't very good at these manual deploys, so what we need is some change control. Now, who's ever heard of a change control process anywhere that sped things up? No, it doesn't happen. So change control will make things a lot slower. And yet, we had this newly energized agile development team who were actually getting a lot better at writing new features and sort of churning up a backlog of new features that needed to get into production so the next release got bigger, had more risk, still got handed over to me to deploy manually, and you just kind of had this churn where eventually you all got outsourced, and then that was supposed to fix everything. <laughs> so, you know, typical scaling challenges from the operations guy's point of view, was, you know, am I deploying this code correctly? Well, it worked fine on my laptop. I'm not sure why you're having trouble deploying it. Um, what, what do all these logs mean? And uh, like, who's on call because I, I don't know how to fix it. So uh, hopefully that kind of resonates with some of you here. Uh, you've been on either end of that conversation. So when we come along now to talk about DevOps, like how is that different from the way we've kind of done this dysfunctional way of getting code from idea into done? How, how is DevOps different? Well, let's talk about this guy for a minute. Everybody know, anybody know who this is? Okay, this is uh, Dr. Vogels. He's the 
Amazon CTO, and if I can sum up DevOps for you, I think he said it best back all the way in 2006. He said the traditional model is that you take your software to the wall that separates development operations and throw it over and then forget about it. Uh, not at Amazon. You build it, you run it. So, you know, this is why I think, you know, at Amazon, we want to try and share some of what we've learned over the past almost 20 years, kind of building a, you know, fairly large, fairly uh, scaling, scalable website and uh, web ecosystem. And, you know, I think uh, Werner has really put the, the nail on the head, as it were, as to what's different about DevOps. Now, DevOps wasn't a thing, it wasn't a buzzword at all until kind of, um, you know, Patrick Dubois had DevOps days in uh, Belgium in 2009. But, you know, three years before that, we were already kind of talking about DevOps without that name. That, you know, if we look at what's, what's different, you know, from the kind of diagrams we looked at before, well, if you build it and you run it, then it's going to be one team. That might be heresy now. I started out with obvious non-controversial stuff, and I think there's going to be some things that are maybe a little more controversial as we go through here. But, you know, if, if you're kind of doing DevOps that you build it, you run it, well, if you build it and somebody else runs it, that's not DevOps. Um, and this feedback loop is really important as well. So when, when, when we look at DevOps, and, you know, one of the things I've done over the past couple of years is I ended up writing a thesis on kind of what were some of the adoption pieces of DevOps and what they look like. So the, the next is kind of my list and what we've seen at Amazon as what are some of the inputs to DevOps? Like, you know, at Amazon, we talk a lot about is if you're trying to reach an objective, you want to be clear on what your inputs are versus your outputs. It might sound obvious, but it can kind of help clear your thinking when it comes to you're trying to reach a certain objective, have a certain outcome. You need to know, you know, if you're baking a cake and you want it to rise perfectly and be moist and, you know, airy and really taste good, well, that's difficult to manage too. What you really want to manage to is having the right ratio of ingredients, an oven heated to the right temperature, you know, beat the eggs to the right consistency, not too little, not too much. And there's a bunch of inputs you have to manage carefully, and that's really where you should focus your efforts in order to get the outcome of, you know, the perfectly baked cake. So when we look at the inputs to DevOps, you know, I'm going to argue that organization and culture are the first thing to DevOps. That if you're not talking about how are we organized and what is our culture like as an organization, then, then you're probably jumping ahead of the game when it comes to DevOps. And then DevOps is relentless about automation. That if you're doing DevOps, there should be a high proportion of automation in what you're doing. DevOps is obsessed with feedback loops as well. How can we take feedback and improve the product that we're building? And then infrastructure is code. So, um, you know, the, the conference organizers were very explicit in their directions to folks to say, please do not make this a product pitch. So I promise not to bore you with, you know, our 40 plus services at Amazon and talk about cloud services endlessly, but we might mention one or two when we talk about infrastructure as code. And then um, this is going to probably be more controversial, but I think microservices architecture and the emergence of, you know, whether you call it SOA or microservices or something in between, um, it's fundamental if you want to do DevOps and you want to do it well. So we're going to jump in and talk a little bit about each of these, and um, you know we'll see how we go. So the first one that I really like that I came across a little while ago is Conway's Law. Who's heard of Conway's Law? Well, this is good. This is a this is a good turnout. For those who can't see, there's maybe 20%. So Conway's Law. Um, Essentially, the punchline is that, you know, organization and culture matter when you're building software. But what he said way back in 1968 is that an organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So that, you know, the, the example is that if you have four connected teams and you give them the task of going and building a compiler, they'll come back with a four-pass compiler. And this... You know, it resonates with me because if you have a complicated slash dysfunctional organizational structure, you're going to have complicated dysfunctional software as an output of that. So when we look at how most organizations are structured, this is kind of the way we've done things for the past 
20 odd years is that you'll kind of go up in technology stacks and you'll be organized by technology discipline. So you might have others than these and you know, don't take this as the end, but take the idea from it that you know, you'll have a team organized by technologies, maybe networking or databases, and then some development teams kind of coding who have to then interact and hand off or rely on these uh, underlying teams in order for their software to work. And if you think about DevOps and you know, how you can scale, well, we, we see something that instead looks more like this, which are you know, vertically oriented teams around services. And you know, quite frankly, at AWS and at Amazon, this is how we organize. So if you think of all those services that you go look at in the console, um, well, you know, each one of these has a service team who are fully responsible for that as a service to, to the customers of that service. And so we're, we're hearing from customers that this is a successful way to organize and to think about your organization and your culture. So a few ideas then around if you're thinking of scaling your org or designing your, your organization to support a DevOps type model, what are some of the things you want to work with? Well, again, from, from kind of sharing from Amazon experience, we think it's important that you start with your customer in whatever you're building and then work backwards from there. We've even got some internal techniques that we use when we design software is that often the first artifact we'll produce will be a uh, fake press release or an internal only press release announcing the product. And that might sound a bit of a strange way to do it to kind of start at the end, but we really want to kind of sharpen our minds to make sure that what we're building is going to have real impact to customers and talk about that first. That's one of the techniques we use when we look at building new products at Amazon. And then I would encourage you to hire full stack developers. So what do I mean by a full stack developer? Well, you know, if we go back to that layer cake of, you know, guys who only know how to code, but they don't know anything about OSs or networking or databases, you're going to struggle to have a, a vertically integrated service or a service team if you don't have full stack developers who can at least learn all the pieces in the stack that require, are required to get your service out and going. And then I would argue that you should adopt a you build it, you run it policy like Werner talked about, uh, you know, kind of nine years ago. And what do we mean by that? Well, practically, your developers should have access to production. I know it's heresy and apologies for being controversial, but, you know, how can, how can you run it if you don't have access to it? So that doesn't mean run it by going telling someone else how to fix it. And it also means that, you know, the people who wrote the code are probably the best ones to know how to fix it when it breaks. And not to mention that there's a pretty immediate feedback loop there that if you're getting woken up in the middle of the night by, by a pager when your code breaks, you're much more directly motivated to make sure that it breaks less. You know, another, another construct we talk about at Amazon is the uh, two pizza team. Well, everybody heard of a two pizza team? Oh, surprisingly few. So uh, this is kind of a silly one. Um, but, you know, the idea is that if your team grows where you can't feed them with two pizzas, then it's probably too big. And you should split them off into two teams. So, you know, a small focused team is going to be a lot more successful than a large team. That, that's our theory on that. And, you know, uh, one of the things at Amazon is that, you know, I, I, as part of my job, do a lot of hiring and interviewing. And I think one of the keys to our success so far, and we want to be humble about that success and not think that we've, you know, uh, finished it, if you like, that we're, we're still motivated every day to go off and get better. But one of the keys to that, that, you know, I think the innovation engine is still as strong as it was when, when we started the company, is that we're hiring for attitude and then teaching skills. So there, you should figure out what that culture looks like for you. What are those important values uh, that you're not willing to compromise on. You know, for us, one of them, we, we've actually codified those as a list of 14 leadership principles at Amazon, and I won't go through every one. But, you know, if we start at the top here where it's, you know, start with your customers and work backwards, that's how we talk about our customer obsession leadership principles. We want people who come in and will not compromise on the fact that they will start with our customers and, and you know, obsess over the customer experience. So whatever that is, you should look for people when you're hiring and looking to scale your organization who are aligned with your, your values and principles. And then if, if they're lacking a skill or two, they'll probably learn them quickly. Whereas sometimes the temptation is to find technical superstars and then assume that they'll just get into line and adopt your culture. 
that's a recipe for disaster. And, and we would recommend against it. So um, as we go on and move from org and talk about automation, well, you know, DevOps is, is really obsessed with this idea of automating everything. So when we look at automation, well, what kind of things should I be automating? Every type of testing, including security testing, should be automated as much as possible. And, you know, unit functional load, et cetera. But security is the really interesting one that it used to be when you had software done and it had gone through kind of QA, UAT, whatever kind of, you know, uh, different test environments, then as kind of a last, like, almost throwaway thought, it's like, I guess we should get the security team to test this and make sure there's no vulnerabilities. And, you know, then you'd go and you'd find that there were major things you needed to go fix before they would let you release it to production and it would take ages and you have to go back to developers who were already working on something else. And so, you know, DevOps talks a lot about shifting processes left. And so things like security testing should get pushed as far left as possible and get automated so that they are running right in your development cycle as, as development is happening, as continuous builds are happening. So, you know, you, if you're not using a, a CI, CD approach, you really should think about it. That you, you want, you know, as people check code in, that it's getting built, it's getting tested, and, you know, you're getting immediate feedback on if you're breaking things. But then infrastructure deployments and scaling should also be automated. So, you know, when it comes to infrastructure deployments, it, uh, the, the actual tool and technique is probably less important than picking an automation framework or tool that you're happy with and doing a good job at getting it, getting it working. Like, don't necessarily get hung up on that I have to use a specific tool. That's a lot better. You know, even a, a lesser tool choice is better than no automation in that piece. And then, you know, you want to also, you know, this feedback loop we talked about with DevOps, you want to get your log analysis and production feedback uh, automated as well. So when, if we kind of share some ideas from our experience around automation, well, you know, there's just a bunch of tools that kind of come to mind here that we've seen customers using. You know, hopefully everybody's using Jenkins or, or something similar for uh, CI, CD activities. Uh, the guys at Electric Cloud, if you're from a, from a horse, and you don't want, you're a bit scared of open source software, the guys at Electric Cloud actually have some pretty cool tools around, uh, you know, a commercial version of this that can, you know, split builds out across multiple servers and give you nice dashboards and things. Um, you know, automating your deployments and managing environments, things like Chef for Puppet or, you know, in the AWS ecosystem, things like CloudFormation and OpsWorks. And then there's tons of emerging things around that managing your logs and, uh, and log analysis. So, you know, starting at the right-hand side, you know, things like Elasticsearch plus Kibana are, are a pattern we're seeing regularly with customers, if you don't mind kind of installing that and configuring it yourself. Or there's, uh, you know, log analysis as a service from, you know, guys all the way from, you know, Splunk to Logly, Datadog, Sumo Logic, et cetera. So um, as, a, as a final kind of call out, I wanted to put the guys from Redline 13 up on a kind of slide of their own, because I think they're doing some really cool stuff. If you're looking for ways to automate your load testing, um, who's got a perfect load testing solution? Yeah, uh, no hands went up. So um, I, I'm not saying this is perfect, but if you're looking for a way to automate or even just improve your load testing, Redline 13 are really cool. So they call themselves almost free load testing. What they do is their service is actually free, and you only pay for the EC2 resources that they spin up for you to load test. And, you know, they talk about crazy numbers, like they can simulate 50,000 users hitting your website uh, for an hour for something like $2 um, using spot instances. And they orchestrate it to bring it up. You put your tests in. Um, I'd encourage you, if you're looking for uh, cool tools and, uh, you know, things that you can take away from this that practically help, Redline 13 is a cool one, and we've uh, seen customers have a lot of success with it. So... When, when you're thinking about automation, you know, I already talked about this, you want to try and shift those key activities left in your pipeline, you know, as close to the development activity as possible. You want to adopt CI, CD. You know, we've had a lot of interesting chats this uh, conference about containers. And again, uh, you know, Docker is the flavor of the month. It's going to be very interesting to see if that's, uh, you know, a trend that continues. But, you know, picking a containerization strategy and tool uh, is important and, you know, I, I'm not sure there's a dogma on our side as to which one that's going to be. And then treating your infrastructure like code. So, you know, if your infrastructure uh, is codable, there's some things, you know, around it needing to have APIs, et cetera, that, 
are going to be pretty important. So we're, we're going to talk about that in a bit. Um, the last bit is an interesting one that a lot of people think, well, how can I give my developers access to production? I've got, I'm a horse and I've got separation of duties and all kinds of things that startups don't have to worry about. Well, what we're finding is that auditors and, you know, ITSM consultants, etc., are actually really happy with a production environment that no one has access to. Well, what do we mean by that? Is if, if you have a fully automated deployment system and it, the logs from those application servers are going off to something like S3 and then are getting analyzed, let's say, by Elasticsearch Kibana and you're, you've got alerting and monitoring on those logs and feedback happening, well, it's quite possible to get to a situation where you never have to SSH or RDP into your production servers. It's not possible in one day, but it is a, a good aspirational goal to shoot for in terms of that's when you know you've kind of got lights out cloud computing is if you never have to and you actually don't have access in or SSH even running on your production servers because they are fully automated. So um, it would be an interesting one to hear what reaction is like to that. But um, let's go on and talk a bit about feedback loops. So when, you know, I think these feedback loops are really interesting on how you, uh, how you get feedback from your running applications in production. The first thing is we've already heard today and yesterday that really storage is ubiquitous now. It's really never cost less than it does now, so you should log everything. And um, you can analyze now or you can analyze later. In fact, we'd encourage you to do both. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk on Spark earlier. It's something I want to jump into and play with a little more. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different tools for this, but if, if you log everything, then you can set up some real-time uh, analysis, uh, as in the analyze now. And then you might have questions you want to ask through a big data analysis that you don't know those questions yet, so you save it and you analyze it later as well. And, you know, the, the real point from this is that you want to be data-driven in how you manage your, your application and how you make decisions on what you're going to do next and how you're going to take the shape of your product. So, you know, the, the, the point is that often our assumptions uh, around being data-driven are wrong. We think we're all smart guys, and there are a lot of clever guys in the room, um, you know, a lot more clever than me, but uh, you, what we think of our intuition, it's often wrong. And, you know, A-B testing has emerged as one of the ways that um, we try and use data rather than just hunches or, or gut feel to make decisions. So one of the, one of the examples I like uh, best is, you know, back from 2008, there was this young senator in the U.S. who was running for election uh, named Barack Obama, and... Um, as the guys were running his election campaign, he actually had some folks from Silicon Valley who were uh, kind of managing the fundraising website. And so they came across and they were wondering, well, maybe we should take some of these A-B testing things we're doing and apply them to fundraising. So they had this question then, like, should we have the, the button on, on the uh, fundraising website for people to go in and actually give us money? Should it say learn more or should it say sign up now? So just as an interesting thought exercise, who in the room thinks that learn more would perform better? And who thinks that sign up now would perform better? Well, in this case, the room is actually right. That what they found in their A-B testing was that 18% better return if they use learn more instead of sign up now. So the next one they wanted to decide was, well, you know, as the main content, should we have a video of Obama at a speech? like giving a speech at a campaign rally? Or should we just have a still photo of the Obama family? And which one of those do you think perform better? Who thinks the speech video would perform better? And who thinks the still photo would perform better? Wow, this is a remarkably intelligent room. That, um, <laughs> that uh, you know, what they found was the combination of those two things the speech video was actually 30% worse, which surprised me. I wouldn't have thought a video did that much worse than a photo. In fact, I guess the video would have done better. But um, that's why I'm in sales and you guys are coders. Um, so wh what they found, though, was that they actually raised another $75 million for fundraising that they could directly attribute back to their A-B testing. And, you know, there were certainly a few people in the room surprised by the answers, and I guess the the punchline or the interesting takeaway from this is that don't guess at what's going to make your product better. Test it and use data from, you know, like we talked earlier, we heard earlier about this kind of event stream of what's going on in your business. I, that resonated with me because that stuff 
Certainly back 10, 12 years ago, if you were running a big production site, you just chucked away all that data and you never, you, there was no way to store it, it was too expensive and you just deleted it all. Um, so that kind of brings us to infrastructure as code. And you know, an API driven infrastructure is something we're pretty passionate about at AWS. And you know, the, uh, the big thing for this is it requires coding skills, surprise, surprise. So um, back at the conference I referenced back in, in October in San Francisco, a DevOps conference, um, I heard a couple guys up on stage and basically the paraphrased version is this, is that if you have the word administrator in your job title, you should learn how to code because your job is going away. And we're seeing this more and more, is that if you are a fill in the blank administrator, that's where automation is taking over. And so much of network and database and operating systems are now being automated that you know you can, you can run an API against your infrastructure and stand up whole stacks programmatically. So this is now the realm of the developer. You can, you can test and check in your infrastructure into version control and then you know, stamp out new versions. So you know, if you're gonna do full automation in your product, you need an infrastructure that's driven by an API, which is probably gonna take you to a cloud computing environment. And you know, this idea of immutable infrastructure is one that's coming up, is that usually in the old days, servers were expensive, so we would install them, put our software on it, and then we would do rolling updates on the same infrastructure. Well now, it's actually easy in an API-driven environment world to have a stack and never touch it again other than pull logs off it, uh, or maybe do some troubleshooting if you have to, but then roll forward to a whole new stack every time you release software. So we're seeing people experiment with these ideas as well. Um, and then the last one is now in an API-driven infrastructure, because servers essentially, you know, the price is heading towards zero, and the cost and overhead of launching one is as easy as a, you know, a click in the console or a, you know, an API call, um, you should design for failure. Gone are the days when servers were precious and you should protect them at all costs. You should just assume they're gonna go away. So there's people like uh, the Netflix guys who've done some fantastic open source tools, things like Chaos Monkey, which they actually run in production and just randomly shuts instances off. And they, they run this all the time. And they, they even do it as far as They've, they've got a bunch of different monkeys now um, in terms of uh, you know, creating chaos in their environment. And the idea is they want a self-healing environment that will, will recover from failure and they want to know what those recoveries look like before they happen. And so they're uh, proactively breaking things in their environment to make sure that their environment can handle it. I think it's super cool. This is an open source tool that you can, uh, you can grab and use yourself. Um, so, you know, the... Talking about Netflix, I think, is a good segue in to talk about microservices. And uh, I wasn't sure whether to put kind of LAMP grayed out and slash through, uh, but really we're seeing that gone are the days of building a kind of monolithic code base. And if you're going to do DevOps, it's really hard to do on one big code base. You want to release faster and faster? Best way to do that is to, you know, scale horizontally with your services as well and be able to do, you know, small less risky releases to each individual composite service rather than one big monolithic code base. So can't talk about microservices without giving a call out to Adrian Cockcroft. Hopefully everybody's heard of him. If not, he knows more about microservices probably than anybody else on the planet. Uh, he was the chief architect at Netflix for a long time and has now gone off to uh, you know, do some other things at a company called Battery Ventures. But um, he has some fantastic talks online. If you want to learn about practically doing microservices, I would really encourage you to go have a look at some of Adrian's uh, talks. So some tips around microservices though. Um, small microservices are better than code monoliths. So split your, your code base into different services. Don't share between them anything except APIs. And, you know, crucially, use the least expensive storage option. What do we mean by this? We see a lot of folks, uh, and I've talked to a lot of customers in my, my job where, you know, they'll just take the default, which is, you know, a LAMP stack, for example. So they'll go, oh yeah, we're using LAMP stack or we're using Ruby on Rails, but all those have a relational database underneath them. Relational databases are fantastic tools, but they are the least scalable, most expensive form of storage. 
So if you don't need a relational database for the job at hand, then don't use one. And we're quite serious about that internally as well. That, you know, what I would say is if you have a monolithic code base, then chances are you're gonna be using one type of database for everything. Whereas if you split things into individual smaller services, you can choose and say, hey, a NoSQL option is better for this type of service, whereas this is maybe a payment service and transactions might be important there, so I'm gonna use a relational database. So, you know, pick the least expensive storage option for, for each one, and then use loose coupling between your services. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about loose coupling, and then as you're building this stuff, you know, optimize for services over servers. What do we mean by services over servers? Well, as kind of a interesting exercise, kind of think through it this way. We used to, and you know, back when, back when I worked for a startup, it was just bare metal. We didn't even have virtualization. And then virtualization came out, but it was kind of, you know, you would manage some virtual machines that were running pretty close to bare metal. And then, you know, guys like AWS came along and let you have cloud instances that at least you could spin up these virtual things from an API. And now we're seeing containers where instead of taking you know, a couple minutes to start up an instance, you can now start up a container as a kind of basically a process in a couple seconds. But now even superseding that, I think, are things like Lambda, which we announced a couple months ago, where you can just take Node.js code, put it in as a, as a cloud function. You don't know or care where it's running, basically. But you can just have event driven. So, well, one of the common use cases we're seeing now is if you want to do things to, to files you upload into S3, say you want to apply a watermark to every photo that gets uploaded to S3, you can now use an event fired from S3 to hit a Lambda function which will transform or do whatever you want to do to that photo, and there's no servers in sight. It's just your code running and you know delivering business value. You don't have to worry about any of the infrastructure underneath that that's happening. So when, when you're thinking of building your product, spend your time building your product, not wrangling servers. So, you know, try and pick the right services which help you do that and are the right tools so that you spend your time, you know, building your unique value for your product and not just becoming a, you know, server farmer. So, if we if we have a few quick things on loose coupling. You know, if you're building loosely coupled servers, well you're probably going to be using queues and whether you use like open source type stuff or things like SQS um, you should use queues. You know, the, to decouple and not have blocking calls go from one service to the other and back everything up is a pattern we like and uh, we'd recommend. And please don't share databases between services. If they're sharing a database, they're part of the same service. So you shouldn't have one big database that just has everything else hanging off it. That's not microservices. And, you know, inter-service communication between API is really important. Um, you should not be calling things at lower levels than that you know, particularly at the database level. And what this is gonna let you do is scale each service independently. So if one service is seeing particular load, you can auto scale that hopefully up to be able to handle that load and have it independent so that, you know, that service becoming contended does not impact others. It also happens to mean you can release updates and changes to a service much more easily so that you don't have to take down your whole site. And the orchestration of releasing updates in a microservices world is way easier than on a big monolithic code base. So how do we know? Well, you know, at Amazon, we kind of went through this world. Now it was back in kind of 2002, 2003, but at that point there was a monolithic code base. It was a product that everybody back then knew and loved called Obidose, and it became a monolithic code base and became really difficult to push updates to. So um, interestingly, Obidose was actually named after the point in the Amazon River that was the narrowest. So I think it was quite appropriately named. But um, what we saw is that we broke it down into a service-oriented architecture so that eventually when you hit Amazon.com, you were actually hitting more than 100 services behind that. So you know, this is not just us kind of preaching. We've, we've been through this and kind of lived it for quite some time that breaking things down into composite services that are easy to execute on and manage individually, there's, there's an orchestration effort for sure to keep all those working together but uh, we think that's kind of the way to success. So if we look back and kind of review these inputs to DevOps, we've talked about organization, we've talked about automation, we've talked about feedback loops, infrastructure as code, and microservices. Well, what can we expect out of DevOps if we do all this? So, you know, we've talked about inputs, let's talk a little bit about outputs. Well, shorter cycle time should be it. That, and 
so I would say if you're doing DevOps and you're not releasing things any faster than before you were doing DevOps, please take a moment of reflection to really think about whether you're doing DevOps or not. And you should have a faster pace of innovation. If you're doing this stuff, you should be able to release things faster. You know, at Amazon, we talk a little, quite a lot about the pace of innovation. And last year, we released more than 500 new products and features on AWS. And part of the reason for that is we split into these individual service teams. Each of them have their roadmap and can execute more or less independently on that roadmap without kind of trying to, you can imagine the coordination if you had to get a committee of 40 different kind of general managers to agree on every release. It would, we wouldn't have released anything last year. So, um, and then fundamentally for your business, you're gonna have all this stuff better. You know, you should have better security, better availability, reliability, performance. This, this really is the promise of DevOps and should be the test you use to determine whether it's worth doing and whether you're doing it to a, to a satisfactory level. So, you know, some of the things that DevOps is not from my observations and our observations, it's not a job title, okay? What I've watched, and I actually heard a hilarious conversation internally where, you know, we have these internal discussion boards and someone was asking, I'm not gonna say who, but um, was saying, I have someone asking me, what would be the right ratio of DevOps engineers to hire two developers. And I was just, you know, this does not compute. Like, if, if you're just taking your production engineers and rebranding them as DevOps, you're not really doing anything other than changing somebody's job title. You're not doing any of the stuff we talked about. You know, and it's not just a tool. A lot of times you'll get vendors or people come along and say, if you just buy my tool, then you're gonna be in DevOps Nirvana and you're all gonna live happily ever after. It, it's unfortunately just not true. Like, the tools should follow the, the thinking and philosophy of what you're trying to do for your product and your business, not the other way around. So, you know, as, as we kind of wrap this up, like, to, to kind of hopefully inspire or, you know, make you think critically about DevOps, like, at Amazon a couple of years ago, we released the stat that we are deploying code to production on average every 11.6 seconds. So, that wouldn't be possible if it was a monolithic code base, by the way that would be hugely dangerous. <laughs> so, you know, every 11.6 seconds and each one of those updates will hit between one and 20,000 servers. So that should hopefully kind of inspire you and be a aspirational goal to get to for whatever software you're building. And then um, I mentioned the Phoenix project before. If you're maybe in the horse category where you're from a more traditional business, you're thinking, what is this guy on about, about DevOps? I'm not really sure whether any of this makes any sense. Um, you should go read this book. It's written in a kind of a novel format of an existing, very traditional business who adopts DevOps to solve some business problems. So, um, fantastic book, and uh, I would highly recommend it. And uh, I've had a chance to meet Gene Kim, one of the authors, great guy, and he really comes from that large enterprise adopting DevOps space, not necessarily startup. So if, if you're kind of in that mindset, I think you'll enjoy it. So as we kind of wrap this up, whether you're a unicorn and from a super sexy, cool startup and already doing DevOps and going, yeah, this the last 45 minutes was a waste because it was all obvious and I'm already doing it, fantastic. But if you're not, if you're from a more traditional business, which is maybe struggling with some of this stuff still and how do we do it, um, I, I hope some of this has been of some help. Really appreciate your time. It's been awesome to be here. Great stuff. Any questions? Yes. Um, hi. Um, I have a question. From a developer point of view, how do you become a full stack developer? From a de the question is, how, from a developer point of view, how do you become a full stack developer? Well, yes. it helps if your infrastructure has an API reference you can go read, because you're probably used to reading those in the stuff you're already coding against. You can go in and read that. But there's, there's a certain amount of learning. From what I've seen, it's probably easier for developers to go down the stack and learn about you know, networking and OSs to the extent they need to, to to roll out their code than the other way around. So I think for infrastructure guys like me, the job is harder because if you haven't coded a lot before, it's a, it's a steeper learning curve.
what if you're in a company that sells um, complicated software to other companies? Um, so you have clients that all have their own data centers and they install your distributed software. Uh, is there any of, of what you said that can be applied in that scenario? So um, my personal view is that the selling installed software to be run elsewhere world is like diminishing. Um, it's it's going to be an interesting one, but I think a lot of the automation pieces around how you how you kind of roll those out. I think all the automation stuff would still be true. I think the infrastructure as code stuff would still be true. Um, so I think a lot of it applies, but it's going to be interesting to see kind of how that business model continues into the future as we see kind of more multi-tenanted software as a service type things take over. Hi. Um, just a question on microservices and uh, teams, teams that are running in microservices. How, how do you find that the teams collaborate and not, for instance, duplicate pieces of code that another team has already written, for instance? Um, is it like, how does it get out there, like documenting what we've done and how, how, do, you, how do you kind of solve that problem um, of uh, not duplicating so much? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure there's a perfect answer to it. What I would say is that um, from watching customers and from our own experience, I think there's probably more benefit to a team having a roadmap and a vision of their own and execu executing on it quickly rather than trying to ensure collaboration across a whole bunch of teams and keep everybody up to speed. So, you know, uh, that should include things like tool choices, language choices, um, you know, code reviews. So uh, it, you may want to consider something like whether they're you know, principal architects or something who will kind of float and, and review things for various teams and make sure that kind of your high level design patterns are being followed. But otherwise, I wouldn't get too hung up on it, would be my opinion. Great, maybe one more question. One more at the back there. So one of the, one of the things you mentioned was um, microservices not sharing data um, but in a sort of big data scenario, wouldn't microservices operate or hang around in a logical fashion around the data? Right, so don't make it a, like an operational requirement to share data. Like they should emit data that you probably want to store somewhere. And you know, if that might get analyzed by big data later, great. But I think my point was don't like put a database that's shared between two different services. That makes them one service. <laughs> 